please welcome Dr. Mark Sandy. The Honorable Mark. <laughs> thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you, Ted and Jeannie May for the, uh, the opportunity. Two hours to speak. That is so kind of you. Uh, nothing, yeah. nothing worse than an economist for more than, uh, how about 20, 25 minutes? Are you guys going to ask questions? Yes. You are. Okay. So I'll, go, I'll prattle for uh, 20, 20 minutes or so and turn it back to you. Um, so Mary, how many employees are Ginny? 100 and 131 employees in uh, how much FH? How much uh, Ginny debt is out there? Uh, MBS out there? Nearly 1.6 trillion. 1.6 trillion. So 131 employees is supporting 1. Point, boy, that's a very productive organ. You know, we could <laughs> we we could improve the productivity of the U.S. economy by giving you five million more dollars. Oh. Yes. <laughs> That's an inside joke, inside joke. Um, but I, you know, I think they deserve five million more dollars for that. Yeah. You know? Absolutely, fantastic organization. Okay, so I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic uh, about the economy. I'm optimistic about housing. I'm optimistic about the mortgage market. I'm optimistic, uh, mm, sort of optimistic about uh, where the housing finance system is going. I'm optimistic about FHA's finances. Maybe I should just stop right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me uh, let me take uh, my 20 minutes and uh, and uh, support my uh, my optimism. Uh, the economy. Uh, the economy is uh, performing well. Uh, the U.S. economy is performing well, and our prospects are good. Uh, that's uh, clearest in the job market, and obviously jobs are key to everything, including housing and, and uh, the mortgage market. Uh, we, our economy created almost three million jobs over the past year. That's a lot of jobs. You have to go back to the uh, teeth of the technology boom in the late 1990s to find a time when we created uh, that many jobs, uh, three million. And uh, when you create three million jobs, you create all kinds of jobs. Uh, yes, we're creating a lot of low paying jobs still, a lot of retail, leisure, hospitality jobs. Uh, but also uh, middle paying jobs, construction jobs are very good uh, middle paying jobs. K through 12, uh, that's back, uh, government is hiring uh, for schools. And a lot of high paying jobs uh, in the professional services uh, in, in technology. Uh, and at the current pace of job growth is sustained, and I think all signs are that it will be sustained. Here's just another statistic for you to give you some, some confidence in that. In uh, the month of July, last data point available from BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there were 5.7 million open job positions, 5.7 million. Uh, a year ago, precisely a year ago, July of 2014, there were 4.7 million job openings. And two years ago, precisely in July of 2013, there were 3.7 million job openings. That's in a pretty amazing increase in open job positions, and I think that augurs very, very well. It's a great leading indicator for future job growth. This train, this, this job train has a lot of momentum, and I think it's going to be very, very hard to uh, knock it off track. So at, at this pace of job growth, if everything kind of sticks to script, uh, we will be back to full employment uh, by the summer of 2016. Um, so if you invite me back a year from now, we will be at full employment. In fact, I'll give you, I'll give you a date. July 15th, 2016, we'll, we'll be at full employment. And actually, this first slide kind of makes that kind of clear. Uh, this shows the so-called underemployment rate. Uh, this is a, a good measure of slack in the labor market. It includes uh, the unemployed. It includes part-timers who would like to work full-time. It includes all those discouraged workers who have stepped out of the workforce but we'll step back in as job opportunities begin to uh, uh, develop. Go back in the middle of the recession, back in 09, 2010, uh, you can see how much slack was in the labor market. It was a, a, it was a mess. Uh, you know, you can see, uh, what, six, seven percent of the labor force. Uh, as of uh, August, the last data point, we're now down to less, the slack in the labor market is less than a percentage point of the labor force. And, at, and as I said, at the current pace of job growth, uh, we will be back to full employment. That 
underemployment gap will be zero by July 15th, uh, 2016. Now, uh, one very uh, important element to my optimism about the economy <clears throat> is as the job market continues to tighten, as that underemployment gap goes to zero, I would anticipate and expect, and this is key to my optimism about our outlook, that we will see stronger wage growth. That as you know, wage growth has been uh, kind of pedestrian. That's a good SAT word, by the way, pedestrian. Uh, um, it means uh, kind of uh, uh, just not really that great. 2% uh, ish kind of wage growth. But if everything kind of sticks to script, we should see that accelerate. And that's obviously very important to housing demand because it means more income, which goes to affordability. And it also goes to confidence. Uh, I think one of the reasons why people still don't quite believe, they listen to guys like me and say, really, is it that good? Uh, they kind of think about the economy through the prism of their own pay, and they see that their pay increase this year wasn't all that much different than it was last year, not much more than the rate of inflation. But I think by this time next year, uh, they will see those bigger paychecks, and uh, that, that means more confidence. So I'm, I am optimistic about the economy. And you know, I've been doing this a long time now, seen a few uh, business cycles, and uh, there's always risks. You know, China is a risk, and uh, Federal Reserve raising interest rates is a risk, and uh, the, uh, the overvalued equity market is a risk. So there's, there's always risk. There's geopolitical risks. But in my 25-odd uh, years of doing this as a professional economist, I, I pretended for five years before that, so, you know, 25 years. Um, the risks feel about as less risky as they have in, the, in those 25 years. That's how confident I feel about our, our economic prospects. So how are you feeling? Okay, all right. Here we go. Uh, I'm optimistic about the housing market. Uh, in part because uh, I think the job market is going to continue to improve and I think that's key to, uh, to housing demand. Um, in part because I think although interest rates are uh, likely to rise, if you buy into my script, the interest rates are likely to rise to go to more typical normal levels. Uh, they will remain low by historical standards and uh, thus uh, the improving job market will trump the ill effects of the higher interest rates and demand will improve. In part because I think the credit box for mortgages is opening and I'll come back to that in a few mu minutes. I, the the, the uh, availability of credit is still tight, I think, by historical standards. It's not where it should be in a typical housing market, but it's moving in the right direction and all the dynamics are pretty good there, so we should see more credit. Uh, but the other reason, a uh, very fundamental reason for optimism in housing is that the level of uh, construction is very, very low uh, compared to underlying demand. Uh, and you can see that in the declining number of vacant homes that are out there. Uh, and that's what's shown here, that's the green line. Uh, those, these are vacant homes for sale, for rent, held off market. So this also includes those properties that are uh, in the foreclosure process. Uh, you can see the, uh, what I can, uh, I'm calling trend vacancy. Uh, it's a, a, a naive, but a, I think a very informative uh, measure of the number of vacant units that you would expect in a reasonably well-functioning economy and housing market. It's rising simply because the size of the housing stock is rising. And so you, you would normally see so vacant units. And you'll note that uh, if you go back again into the teeth of the recession in 09-2010, uh, it was a vastly overbuilt market. There were a lot of vacant homes out there uh, compared to what uh, would be typical, well above trend. But look at it now. Uh, because of the uh, very uh, sharp decline in construction activity, we're just not putting up a lot of homes, uh, single family homes. Uh, and because there's been some pickup in demand, we're now at a point where the housing market is roughly evenly balanced, and all of the dynamics here suggest that it's going to be a, a very significantly undersupplied housing market going forward. And you can see the motivation for that statement in the back of the envelope data that's right there. That shows the current level of construction, roughly speaking. It's a little, a little higher than that now. We've been getting some better numbers the last couple of months. It's closer to 1.1 million per annum. But look at my estimate of trend housing demand. Uh, demand for uh, for homes, new homes, it's 1.7 million per annum. That that's 1.7 million in underlying demand. We're only putting up 1.1 million homes. Uh, vacancy is going to continue to decline. And by the way, vacancy rates, uh, particularly rental vacancy rates, are already at a 30-year low, 
and rent growth is already accelerating very rapidly. And this also argues that house price growth is going to be quite strong because there's going to be a lack of, 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 ha of housing. The market's undersupplied. But the good news here is that we will, this is a very significant tailwind behind the single family market and we will see construction activity pick up to a considerable degree. And uh, uh, that's gonna create a lot of jobs, a lot of income, and it goes a long way to my optimism about the economy. So I think housing, uh, single family housing has um, a, a very good, uh, has very good prospects over the next uh, three or four years. Uh, uh, this graph is a very strong underpinning to the housing market. How are you feeling now? Even better, okay. All right, I'm gonna lift you even higher. Um, uh, the mortgage market. Uh, the mortgage, I'm op very optimistic about the mortgage market as well. We've made a lot of progress uh, working off the legacy problems uh, from the crisis. Uh, credit quality uh, is rapidly improving, and you can see that very nicely here. This shows the number of first mortgage loans that are troubled in some way, 30-day, 60-day, 90-day, 120-day delinquent, and in foreclosure. This is data based on Equifax credit files. So. Uh, it's, uh, we, get, we get all the credit files in the country uh, at the end of every month, and based on that, we can construct uh, uh, data that uh, is similar to this for all types of uh, consumer product li lines and for different types of mortgages. And you can see how much progress we've made. And, and the most interesting thing, uh, at least the thing that's most positive, is that early stage delinquency has uh, uh, declined quite substantially. In fact, in, if you look at the last data point, uh, there were uh, just under one million first mortgage loans that were 30, 60, 90 day delinquent, one million. Just for context, if you go back to 2005, 2006, and remember 2005, 06, that was at the height of the housing bubble, right? That was when things were uh, going straight north, the house prices were surging. There were 1.5 million first mortgage loans that were 30, 60, 90 day delinquent. So early stage delinquency today is meaningfully better than it even was in the height of the bubble back in 05 and 06. Still have a lot of legacy problems, 120 day delinquent foreclosed a property to work through, and much of that is sitting in uh, judicial states with long foreclosure timelines, you know, like New York and New Jersey, Florida. So it will take a while to work through all of that. But on the other side of that, uh, and the other side of that will be a couple, three years down the road, the credit environment is going to look absolutely beautiful. It's going to be pristine. It's never going to be, it, it's going to be as good as it has ever been by orders of magnitude. Uh, no problems whatsoever. And this is very, very important to the credit box, right? Because one of the reasons that it's been uh, so long for the credit box to open, for it to normalize, for credit availability to improve to a point where it's more t typical, it's because uh, everyone that had anything to do with the mortgage market has been, until recently, until the last year or two, kind of in panic mode, nervous about uh, the large number of credit problems, and as uh, it becomes evident, and has become evident, that uh, the credit environment is gonna be very, very good going forward. I think that ass assuages a lot of those concerns, and we'll start to see that, that credit box uh, start to open. I also think there's been a number of uh, changes, uh, regulatory changes that have been quite important, uh, helpful, particularly at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, their work on clarifying the rep and warrant system, uh, very uh, therapeutic, and um, I think the MIs have done a pretty good job. And just as a sidebar, I am on the board of MGIC, so uh, and, uh, uh, MGIC has done a fabulous job. Uh, you know, getting it. Um, so, um, uh, I think uh, uh, a lot of work there in terms of uh, providing clarity around the master uh, plan and, uh, and rescissions. So uh, that's also been uh, quite helpful. And I think the next thing that will happen is as uh, refinancing activity uh, begins to weaken, as you know, it's been quite strong. There's been waves and uh, several waves over the years, but uh, you know, at some point, if I'm right about rising mortgage rates and as fixed mortgage rates rise above uh, firmly above 4%, closer to 45 and 5 there will be uh, many fewer refinancings that they've already been done, and that'll, uh, I think, put pressure on lenders to become even more aggressive and normalize those credit standards, particularly with regard to credit score, 
and we'll start to see credit flow more normally, uh, and uh, that's all to the good. Uh, you know, there's some hand-wringing concern that we might go back to the egregious lending of the bubble years, and I just that's just not going to happen, uh, given the regulatory changes, the QM rule, and everything in Dodd Frank, all the stress testing, all the over the all the regulatory oversight coming from uh, lots of different groups and agencies. Uh, that's just not going to happen. Uh, I think the, the trick here is to get us back to something that's more typical and normal, and we're still not quite there, but I think we're headed in that direction. How are you feeling now? All right, so-so. Um, I'm optimistic about the housing, the, the direction the housing finance system is uh, moving. Um, I think I was, I was actually quite, I think, Upset might be the word, certainly disappointed when uh, the efforts to get Johnson Crapo passed failed. Uh, I know there's a lot of controversy, I'm sure, in the room about that, but I thought that was a, a very good, excellent effort and ultimately would have uh, landed the housing finance system in the right, uh, right place. Uh, so I was very disappointed, uh, but I'll have to say uh, I've been uh, also uh, surprised and and uh, actually uh, very encouraged uh, by development since then. And I think the system, particularly Fannie and Freddie in the direction they're moving, is a pretty good one. Uh, that they are effectively moving in the direction that Johnson Crapo would have taken to them to anyway. And most importantly is their efforts to uh, bring in more uh, private capital in front of the risk that they take. And they're actually doing a surprisingly good job uh, on that front. Uh, and you get a sense of that here. This shows the amount of credit risk that uh, different um, uh, groups within the mortgage finance system are taking. If you go back to 2007, which is the first bar in the chart, uh, that shows uh, the share of credit risk taken by each of these groups uh, for originations in that year. And you'll note that if you look at Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the FHA, of course, at that point, and that uh, prior to the uh, crisis was quite small, they counted for about 40% of the credit risk taken. You can see the private RMBS market, the PLS market, was obviously very active at that point in taking a big part of the credit risk. Uh, shared credit risk back there, it was just largely uh, MIs, so, you know, the MI companies taking credit risk. Look then to 2009, 2010, the picture changed a lot. PLS market went to zero, and of course FHA did uh, a yeoman's job of filling that void. And without FHA, uh, I think our housing market would have been crushed even more than what we actually did suffer. And in fact, you know, I can remember as a young economist looking at FHA and wondering, you know, exactly what do they do and why are they around? Um, and uh, I think we learned. Uh, vividly why uh, in, the, in the crisis. They were put on the planet in the wake of the Great Depression of the 30s, and uh, they uh, played the same function in the Great Recession in the financial crisis. Without FHA, without uh, VA, without Ginnie Mae, uh, it would have been, uh, it was a mess. It would have been just, uh, you know, complete, utter fiasco. We'd have gone into the abyss. So it was very important, and they, they filled the void. But look, Look more recently, uh, 2013 is the last full historical data point, more or less. And you'll note that Fannie, Freddie, uh, FHA, uh, share of credit risk being taken in the originations in 2013 have come in very significantly, about half the market in the private uh, sector, private uh, capital is now taking about half the credit risk. 2014, 15 are still uh, largely my estimates of the risk sharing deals that will actually con occur. They're not, they're not in the books yet. I think they'll occur, and so it's about half. So we're not quite back to pre-recession levels in terms of you know, what private capital, the burden private capital is, is taking, but we're pretty close, not too bad. And uh, in my mind, this is a very, very positive development. In fact, you may even go so far as to say, I may even go so far as to say that um, you know, maybe this is a better approach than legislation. You know, because with legislation, you have this big bang moment when you kind of have to go from the, the old system to the new system. There's different ways of mitigating that risk, but at the end of the day, you know, there, there is a, uh, a hard stop. Uh, there isn't one in the current process. So 
we're uh, allowing this process to unfold and allows for experimentation. We can see what happens in the next stressed period because that's key. We want a housing finance system that operates not only in the good times like now, but in the stressed times, and we're going to get a better sense of that. And we can allow Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to come in and out of the market and see how that works and see how graceful they are and what it means for pricing and all those kinds of things. So I actually think uh, this is all going to work out pretty well, at least so far. Now, obviously, this isn't codified in legislation, and it could change depending on who's you know, uh, guiding the ship. But, uh, but the ship has left, this, you know, left the port, and it's going to be pretty hard to turn it around. So this all feels pretty, pretty good to me. How are you feeling now? I'm, you know, this is it, you know. <laughs> Got one more, one more, one more. And that's the FHA and uh, Ginny Mae. I, uh, I am uh, very optimistic about uh, the uh, finances of the FHA program. Um, I think uh, it has obviously made a lot of progress, and I think uh, it's uh, clearly headed in the right direction. And these are my crude estimates. I know the actuary is going to come out with their estimates for the, uh, in, uh, the insurance fund in November, so we'll see how good my forecast is. Uh, this is based on my forecasts of interest rates, house prices, and uh, everything else that goes into the calculation. Uh, I'm breaking down uh, the forecast for the capital ratio into uh, the HECM program, the reverse mortgage program, and the, the forward program. And I do that because, obviously, the HECM program is uh, you know, you know, more of an issue. And actually, interestingly enough, uh, it becomes more of a problem when your interest rate projections decline. So everyone's been lowering their interest rate projections, including me. And every time you do that, because of the way you do the present value calculation of the cash flows, it makes the HECM program look even worse. So it makes it even more difficult to get back to uh, capital ratios that you think are appropriate. This uh, is under the current uh, FHA premiums, the lower premiums that were uh, implemented at the start of the year. Uh, and uh, so they account for that. And you'll note that we're back to the 2% capital ratio, I believe. I can't quite see it. I think it's 2018. Is that right? 2018 or 2017, 2017, and then uh, I'm also highlighting a four and a half percent capital ratio. Uh, that's we get to that out in uh, 20, 22, 23. Uh, in my mind, that's where the uh, the the fund the, um, the insurance fund needs to go in the long run to be sure that in the next stress scenario. Uh, the fund never has to, the uh, FHA never has to go back to Treasury for any, any support. So we need that, uh, that's where we need to head. But we're, you can see we're going to get there uh, in the not too distant future. So prospects are good. Let me end though by saying that I don't think we're completely finished here with what we could do to ensure that uh, my optimism comes to pass. I really want my forecast to be right. Um, and uh, that requires. Uh, a little bit more from policymakers. Uh, a couple things they, they could and should do. I just want to focus on one of them and then I'll end because this is at top of mind. I, in, I think it is very important. Uh, in fact, I'd say this is the most important thing policymakers could do right now to make a difference to the mortgage market, the housing market, to our economy over the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, and that is to uh, address the uh, loan level cer certification issue. Uh, you know, if you've been following this, uh, there's um, a, a tension. Uh, the FHA appropriately wants to uh, protect taxpayers in the FHA fund. They don't, if, if lenders are doing uh, wrong things and, and lending poorly, uh, the FHA should appropriately uh, be able to uh, penalize uh, those lenders. So there, there is that uh, that need, that fiduciary responsibility. But the FHA also has a fiduciary responsibility to ensure that there is uh, available credit and that, uh, that uh, access to credit is, is uh, freely open. And I think there are things that can be done uh, to the loan level certification process that will meet uh, those two requirements, both the requirement to protect taxpayers but also to uh, support the availability of credit. And I think it's very, very important for the FHA and all the other interested parties in this, the Department of Justice, the administration, Congress, uh, to uh, come to some agreement on this and change that 
certification process so that we can get all lenders participating in the FHA program. That if we uh, have the smaller non-bank lenders in, that's fantastic and great, but we also want the big guys playing as well, and they're not, uh, and they're pulling back, and that's not healthy for the FHA program for the insurance fund longer run in that stressed environment. So uh, if w there's one thing that we could do to make a difference, that would be it, and I would uh, strongly argue that, uh, that the interested parties get together and, and solve that problem. On that note, I'm gonna stop. I took my 20 minutes, uh, I think almost precisely 20 minutes, uh, maybe 21 minutes, pretty good for an economist. And uh, I'll turn it back to you uh, for any questions or comments that you might have. And by the way, how are you feeling? <laughs> so what's bugging you? Yeah, there's a question over here. I think they want to bring the mic over so they can. Mark, so you, so you did a good job of showing when FHA would be in the black, but given the fact that Treasury is taking all the capital and profits out of Fannie and Freddie, where do we mythically end up in there? Um, Well, my sense is that uh, the best way to go is the path that we're on, where Fannie and Freddie continue to risk share and uh, continue to push out more of their risk to, uh, uh, to private capital. And there's still a long way to go here, a lot of things that could be done and experimented with and I think will be ultimately successful. You know, reinsurance, you know, again, I, I tell you, I'm on the MI, on MI board, deep MI coverage. Uh, you know, all those things need to be explored and developed more fully. Uh, see what the pri what pricing effects there are, what effect it has on the availability of credit to people on the edge of the credit box, you know, uh, for affordable lending, all those kinds of things. But if they continue to do that, Fannie and Ray, Freddie continue to do that, you know, over time, they will become uh, more like catastrophic reinsurers, right? So if that's the case, then their G fee LLPA should continue to decline, and they shouldn't be charging 60 basis points per annum, it, particularly if you're doing front, you, you, it's not only back end, it's front end, they haven't done any front end resharing, they go down the front end resharing line. And so the amount of money that's flowing into Fannie and Freddie as we call them today, they, you know, be something very different maybe 10, 15 years from now, will be quite modest you know, very small, and you know, it won't be 60 basis points. They're not gonna be never as efficient as Ginnie Mae at six basis points. I mean, again, you know, that, you know come on, give them their five million bucks, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the, uh, but uh, you know, you're not gonna see, you know, the profitability that uh, currently exists. So that's how I would envisage this going I mean, that may, you know, there's a question of normative and positive, meaning what will happen and what should happen. I just articulated what should happen, and I'm hoping that's what will happen. Of course, you know, we could get derailed here, but, you know, that's what it feels like is happening and where we're headed. And therefore, you know, they're not going to be making, you know, even now, they're not making 20, you know, the, the sort of the rule of thumb was they were making together 20 billion in profits, right? My guess is their underlying profitability is lower than that given all the things that are going on, and it'll be much, much lower than that 10 years from now if, if that train, that risk-sharing train continues to move down the track. So that's how I would envisage it going. Yeah. What else is bugging you? Hi, Mark. Um, is there anything on the, um, on the political or regulatory landscape that would dampen your enthusiasm and optimism? Yes. Um, <laughs> damn, Congress. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you see Jamie Dimon on Meet the Press? I think he said it quite nicely. You know, if you shut down the government, that's like, that's bad management. That's pretty counterproductive. Uh, you know, if it's a day or two, that's a nuisance, particularly for the people who work in government. It's not a big deal from a macro perspective. 
But you know, if you, if you shut the down, government down for any length of time, that becomes more of an issue. Even more damaging is if they play brinkmanship with the debt ceiling. I mean, come on, uh, that's just nuts. Uh, to what end, uh, you know? Uh, so that would potentially, uh, you know, mess things up. But let, let, let me say this um, about the political risk. Uh, the fact that these guys are all tied in knots may not be such a bad thing from that perspective. You know, they're, they're literally tied in knots. They can't get anything done. Uh, and it would be nice to get things done, like giving Ginny Mae its $5 million. Uh, but, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, other than that, it's like it's going to be very difficult for anything that, to happen uh, until on the, perhaps on the other side of the presidential election. Maybe you get a window and you get, you get things we should get done, like immigration reform would be nice and some tax reform and that kind of thing. So at least for the you know, next uh, year and a half or so, two years, uh, I think the fact that uh, Congress is kind of uh, you know, uh, in this mess, this political mess, may actually turn out to be okay, just as long as they don't shut the government down or play brinkmanship with the, with the debt limit. Yeah. I don't know, do we have time for one more question, Ted, or we should call it quits? Thank you very much, it was a pleasure.